Good evening, everybody. Assalamu uh, alaikum, Jamian. Welcome to our Young Leader Forum webinar. This is our uh, third session. Uh, it is an activity held by the Emirates Diabetes Society. Our uh, theme for tonight will be diagnostic and therapeutic approaches of adrenal uh, diseases. We'll be having three presenters, uh, followed by the Q&A sessions. Uh, following that, we'll be having our fourth presenters, that is that will be uh, a sponsored uh, presentation. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, for uh, tonight, our activity is sponsored by Servier. Thanks, Servier, for sponsoring our academic activity. And uh, our activity is uh, CME accredited by Dubai Health Authority. Uh, uh, for all the attendees, uh, you will be receiving a survey uh, within 10 days of this session. Kindly fill the survey. Following that, you will be receiving your CME credits. Our uh, webinar is uh, uh, will be available on demand on both the EDS Institute and the EDS YouTube uh, channel. Uh, during our presentations, uh, for any of the attendees, who have, if you have any questions, you can always post your questions during the sessions, and it will be presented toward the end of the presentations. So I hope you enjoy today our presentations, and uh, we will start with our first presenter, Dr. Fatma al -Kabi. Dr. Fatma is a consultant endocrine at Tawam Hospital. Dr. Fatma has completed her fellowship and training at, on endocrine and diabetes at the Imperial College in London in UK in 2018. Dr. Fatma will give us a talk today about approach to adrenal incidentaloma. Dr. Fatma, uh, kindly, the floor is yours. Share your presentation and unmute your mic. Thank you, Bidur. Good evening, everybody. The outline of my presentation uh, tonight, I will talk about the definition, the prevalence, uh, the etiology of adrenal incidentaloma, the diagnostic strategy, the follow-up guideline and consideration for surgery, the risk of malignant transformation or overt hypersecretion, uh, some special circumstance, and finally, some update. I will start by the definition of adrenal incidentaloma. It is adrenal mass detected on image not performed for a suspected adrenal disease or during uh, evaluation for extra adrenal malignancy. Um, and the cutoff size to start, uh, sorry. The cutoff size to start uh, the workup is more than or equal one centimeter unless there is clinical sign or symptom of hormonal excess. Regarding the uh, precise prevalence of uh, adrenal incidentaloma, it is difficult to define. Most of the data are derived from autopsy or radiological study that difficult to interpret due to retrospective nature, insufficient clinical information, or different patient selection criteria. However, CT scan study have reported prevalence of 4.4% and some study 7% and it increased to up 10 to percent in elderly population. With regard to prevalence by age from autopsy data, you can see here clearly uh, above the age of 70, the prevalence was uh, around 7% and some other data is uh, around 10%. However, in younger population is less than 0.2. The etiology of adrenal incidentaloma could be benign or malignant, and the region can be derived from the adrenal cortex, the medulla, or extra adrenal. Here in this slide, you can see the adrenal incidentaloma frequency of different underlying tumor type from serious include all patients with adrenal mass and uh, some surgical serious. However, the reported frequency is uh, not reflecting a random sample of all population. Therefore, the number here is sometimes like overestimated. 
uh, the, there is clear evidence that the vast majority of adrenal incidentaloma are benign adrenal um, cortical adenoma. Moving to the diagnostic strategy, when we come across adrenal incidentaloma, we should assess in parallel the functional status and the malignant potential. I will start by the functional status. We should take full history and reform clinical examination for symptom and sign of adrenal hormonal excess. And the hormonal workup uh, should include the following. We should exclude the autonomous cortisol secretion, previously known subclinical cushion syndrome. And we should exclude fucromocytoma. In some situation, we have to exclude primary aldosteronism. And in some also uh, scenario, we, can, uh, we have to exclude six steroid secretion. I will start by uh, autonomous cortisol secretion. It is the commonest functional abnormality in a patient uh, with adrenal incidentaloma with a prevalence rate up uh, from 10 to 20%. And it is non-ACTH dependent autonomous cortisol secretion from the adenoma. No obvious clinical feature of Cushion syndrome. And the diagnostic test for autonomous cortisol secretion is uh, the, the recommended by almost all the guidelines that all patients with adrenal incidentaloma should undergo one milligram overnight dexamethasone suppression test to exclude cortisol excess. And the interpretation of the result of one milligram overnight dexamethasone test should be continuous rather than categorical variable. Here uh, in this slide, uh, I want to show you the latest recommendation by the European Society of Endocrinology uh, with the collaboration of uh, European Network for uh, the Study of Adrenal Tumor. They proposed the following for assessment and management of autonomous cortisol secretion in patients with adrenal incidentaloma. When the result of cortisol level post one milligram dexamethasone test less than or equal 50 nanomole per liter, they consider it uh, as exclusion and uh, for autonomous cortisol secretion. No further uh, follow-up uh, recommended unless there is new clinical sign or symptom appear. When the result between 51 to 138 uh, nanomole per uh, liter, uh, they call it possible autonomous cortisol secretion. And here we have to assess the comorbidity related to autonomous cortisol secretion. I will mention them later. And with the prince with this comorbidity, we have to perform annual uh, follow-up, uh, and in some cases, we can refer for surgery. When the result above uh, 138 nanomole per liter, they call it autonomous cortisol secretion. And here also, we should assess uh, the presence of other comorbidity related to cortisol secretion. And in both cases, uh, the uh, comorbidity present or not, when we have autonomous cortisol secretion, we have to perform annual follow-up. Uh, and reassessment, and in some cases uh, also we can consider surgical removal. With regard uh, other uh, uh, tests uh, like 24-hour free cortisol and late-night salivary cortisol and high dexamethasone, uh, it's uh, suggested by some author and some uh, guideline. However, uh, the public literature is too limited and uh, controversial to make clear statement on this test. And uh, there is few studies suggest poor performance of this parameter, and there is increased likelihood of being false positive results. Moving to comorbidity that possibly associated with uh, incidentaloma with autonomous cortisol secretion, we should screen patients for hypertension, diabetes, and osteoporosis, and screen for vertebral fracture and offer appropriate treatment of these conditions and annual clinical assessment for cortisol excess comorbidity. Moving to fucromocytoma, approximately 3 to 5% of adrenal incidentaloma proved to be fucromocytoma. And 60% uh, of patients with few are asymptomatic and discovered as adrenal incidentaloma. Excluding fucromocytoma uh, recommended by measurement of plasma metanephrine or urinary fractuated metanephrine, both are highly sensitive. And we should put in our mind uh, that we should also do a uh, reform uh, metanephrine test should be major in patients who are normal tested because not all uh, few people have hypertension. Uh, also, there is what they call it pre-biochemical fucromocytoma when all the biochemical tests uh, may normal in asymptomatic few patient that discover in a pre-biochemical phase. Here, the image phenotype will guide uh, our uh, management. 
Uh, also, I would like to mention that adrenal lesion with image criteria of adenoma, the likelihood of you is extremely low. Therefore, the biochemical test for fecromocytoma should be performed if an enhanced CT attenuation more than or equal 10 house field unit. However, it's not necessary if the house field unit less than 10, unless there is heterogeneity or tumor necrosis in the image or an elderly. This is shown uh, also recently in the uh, in a multi-center retrospective study published in 2019, they analyzed CT report of 533 patients with 548 histologically confirmed uh, FIO. They find low proportion, 0.5% of pechromocytoma with attenuation of 10 house field unit. Moving to a primary aldosteronism, it's a rare cause of adrenal incidentaloma, and the recommendation is to measure plasma aldosterone uh, renin ratio to exclude primary aldosteronism in all patients with hypertension and patients who are normotensive but having subcutaneous hypokalemia. Regarding cystosteroid secretion and testing uh, uh, estradiol and testosterone, DHES, it's, there is no evidence to support routine screen. However, sign uh, and image-based evaluation can guide us. I would like to show you here in this slide uh, the abnormal value of those hormonal workup. I mentioned the autonomous cortisol secretion regarding few chromocytoma, if it's more than two to four upper uh, range normal, and uh, regarding primary aldosteronism, uh, suppressed plasma renin activity and renin aldosterone ratio above 20 to 25, and regarding cystosteroid secretion higher than upper range of normal. Moving to uh, other arm. Uh, assessing the malignant potential. Uh, we should establish if adrenal mass is benign or malignant at the time of initial detection by imaging phenotype and the size. Uh, at, uh, CT scan, MRI, and FTG PET CT are the three uh, modality that currently used to uh, uh, assess the adrenal. Uh, uh, the non-contrast CT scan is the first line recommended investigation, and CT a low assessment of tissue density by measuring X-ray absorption compared to water and the attenuation expressed in house field unit. There is inverse uh, linear relation between the fat content of the region and the attenuation. Lipid rich adenoma expressed in lower house field unit and an enhanced CT, and the threshold attenuation value proposed for lipid reach benign adrenal adenoma in a patient without history of extra adrenal malignancy is less than or equal to. Uh, we should be careful when uh, we use the house field unit, we should use it in homogeneous lesion. And uh, in the case of heterogeneous lesion, there is a potential to miss more solid component uh, that may be malignant. There, therefore, uh, we should be careful in this scenario. Approximately 30% of benign adrenal adenoma do not contain large amount of fat that have and have attenuation more than uh, 10 house field unit. They call, they call them lipid poor adenoma. Therefore, we cannot characterize them by an enhanced CT. And there is uh, like overlap between uh, them and the malignant region of chromocytoma. Here comes the rule of the dedicated adrenal workout protocol CT as a next step to assess and characterize lipid poor adenoma. The contrast enhanced washout utilize a unique profusion pattern of the adenoma. The adenoma take up the contrast rapidly and have rapid loss of the contrast. They call it contrast enhancement washout. The malignant adrenal legion usually enhance rapidly but, but demonstrates lower washout of the contrast medium. And here in this slide, you can, you, can, I can, you can see that how we can calculate the absolute and relative washout by uh, using region attenuation measurement at a specific time point in educated adrenal CT. And when absolute washout above or equal 60% and uh, relative washout above or equal 40% if you go with adenoma. Here an uh, example of a little bit poor adenoma with a house field unit in enhanced CT 24 um, and an dedicated uh, contrast washout. It's uh, the absolute washout and relative washout goes with the uh, adenoma. There is some limitation to contrast enhanced washout CT. Fucromocytoma usually shows low contrast washout. Occasionally, that can mimic, uh, uh, but occasionally they can mimic lipid poor adenoma by showing rapid washout. Therefore, we have to be careful. And here comes the role of multidisciplinary team discussion, and we should uh, consider further scanning uh, uh, in order to ensure there is no further growth.
moving to the MRI, MRI have advantage in clinical uh, situation like full up image uh, to avoid radiation exposure of repeated CT imaging or in pregnancy and children. MRI with chemical shifting uh, uh, can distinguish between adrenal adenoma and non-adenoma based on amount of intracytoplasmic fat. Lose of signal intensity and outface uh, image constant with lipid rich adenoma. You can see here uh, image of lipid rich adenoma and adrenal cortical carcinoma. Uh, adrenal cortical carcinoma show uh, not display any signal loss. Moving to FDG bit CT, highly sensitive for detecting malignancy can be helpful in selected patient when there is a period history of malignancy or when the CT uh, uh, and enhanced CT and washout analysis and inconclusive or suspicious for malignancy. Absence of FDG uptake or uptake less than the liver suggests a benign adrenal mass. We have to uh, be careful. There is certain malignant region may be FDG negative, like metastasis from kidney uh, from kidney cancer or low grade lymphoma. Here, uh, image of uh, right adrenal carcinoma with right side rib metastasis. Um, Moving to the size, the maximum diameter of adrenal mass is a predictive of malignancy. Adrenal mass size uh, should not be used only parameter to guide our treatment. Uh, this is illustrated in a study published by the National uh, Itali uh, by the National Italian Study Group of Adrenal Tumor. Uh, the data was collected from 29 centers between uh, 1980 and 1995. Uh, and they show that adrenal uh, cortical carcinoma significantly associated with mass size, with 90% being more than four centimeter in diameter when discovered. And this uh, table from the same study uh, show the diagnostic power of different cutoff value of mass size and uh, differentiation of primary adrenal cortical cancer from benign mass. And you can see that four centimeter have high sensitivity, but also at the same time, a specificity of uh, only 42%. Uh, this data uh, from other uh, uh, cohort, the Mayo series, it's a single cohort of 4,085 patients with adrenal mass, 705 with adrenal mass measuring four centimeter or more, and the prevalence of adrenal cortical carcinoma and malignant tumor was uh, 31%. Uh, with regard uh, the other predictor for malignancy, they found that older age at diagnosis, male gender, non-incidental mode of discovery, large tumor size, higher uh, and enhanced CT attenuation are pre a predictor for uh, malignancy. Moving to adrenal biopsy, adrenal biopsy has limited role in evaluation of adrenal mass. We can use them in uh, infection or in the case of metastasis disease. However, we, when we perform a, a biopsy, we should make sure that the following criteria are fulfilled. The lesion is uh, hormonally inactive and few chromocytoma has been excluded. The lesion has not been characterized as a benign in the image, and the management will be altered by the knowledge of the histology. Otherwise, we, we don't need to perform adrenal biopsy. Regarding guideline for follow-up and consideration for surgery, I will summarize in the coming few slides uh, the clinical guideline. I will start by the imaging follow-up. NIH uh, statement in 2002, they recommend six to 12 months, then nil if there is no growth. The ACE in 2009, they recommend three to six month image, then annually for one to two year. The European Institute of Endocrinology in 2016, they recommend no follow-up of clearly benign, defined by uh, benign uh, uh, being less than four centimeter, homogeneous and house field units less than 10, an uh, initial image. Otherwise, six to 12 months with a mass for more than four centimeter or indeterminate characteristic and consider further image at similar interval if the growth between 10 to 20 or less than 0.5 centimeter. In the case of growth more than 20% uh, or more than uh, 0.5 centimeter, then we have a uh, fair for surgery. Regarding hormonal follow-up, the NIH statement in 2002, they recommend annually for four years. The ACE, they recommend annually for five years. However, the European in 2016, they don't recommend further follow-up in a normal hormonal workup at initial evaluation and this new clinical sign suggestive of endocrine activity de develop later on. However, also they recommend hormonal evaluation 
for patients with autonomous cortisol secretion and uh, possible autonomous cortisol secretion with, associated with comorbidity. Moving to the consideration for surgery, the NIH in 2002, the cutoff recurring for the surgery more than six centimeter or between four and six in high risk appearance, uh, absolute growth more than one centimeter in a follow up image, a hormonary secretory, and it is it, it could be either laparoscopy or open, uh, depend in this uh, clinical scenario. Uh, the ACE in 2009, they recommend more than or equal four centimeter, high risk appearance, absolute growth more than one centimeter, hormonary secretory, and open surgery if adrenal cortical carcinoma suspected. The European 2016, there is no absolute cutoff uh, for repair for surgery. They consider from more than four centimeter or indeterminate appearance, high risk appearance, or there is growth more than 20% in large tumor diameter during six to month uh, follow up image and or hormonal hormonary secretory and the laparoscopy surgery for unilateral less than six centimeter and when there is no invasion otherwise individualized approach if not be think above criteria what is the risk of um, malignant transformation um, of adrenal incidentaloma Overall, the risk of uh, untreated adrenal incidentaloma qualified as a benign lesion, subsequently developed malignancy appear to be, to be very low, less than one uh, per 1,000. With regarding the risk of uh, evolving toward uh, hypersecretion during the follow-up, the most common disorder reported during follow-up is occurrence of, of autonomous cortisol secretion. And the risk of development of autonomous cortisol secretion without a sign of overt cushion uh, was reported in a percentage range from zero to 11 among uh, different studies. Uh, while the development of all uh, overt cushion syndrome during follow-up was observed in very small number of cases, 0.3%. This is shown uh, very well uh, in uh, this systemic review and meta-analysis, which published recently uh, in 2019, a follow-up of 4,121 patients with non-function adrenal tumor and uh, mild autonomous cortisol secretion, they found that clinically overt, uh, overt hormone excess cushion syndrome was unlikely to develop uh, less than 0 0.1 uh, in patient uh, in both groups, the patient with non-function uh, adrenal tumor and mild autonomous cortisol secretion. And only 4.3% of patients with non-function adrenal tumor develop mild autonomous cortisol secretion during uh, follow-up. And pre-existing mild autonomous cortisol secretion was unlikely to resolve less than 0 0.1. Uh, hypertension, obesity, dyslipidemia type 2, where uh, type 2 diabetes were more likely to develop and more in patients with mild autonomous cortisol secretion compared to the non-function adrenal tumor. And new vascular events were more prevalent in uh, mild autonomous cortisol secretion compared to non-function, 15.5% uh, per, uh, compared to 6.4%. However, the reported mortality were similar in both the group, 11.2%. With regard to significant growth, they didn't find significant, they didn't report significant growth in both group during the follow-up period, and the malignant transformation was never observed. Moving to the special circumstances, patient with bilateral adrenal mass should be assessed um, in identical uh, way for, of, uh, uh, to the patient with unilateral adrenal incidentaloma. So we should perform clinical and hormonal assessment, and also we should follow the same image protocol of unilateral adrenal mass. Uh, we should also uh, put in our mind that when we have large bilateral adrenal mass with metastasis, we should assess the residual adrenal function. And uh, they don't recommend uh, in almost the guideline bilateral adrenectomy to perform for autonomous uh, patient with autonomous cortisol secretion without a clinical sign of over uh, cushion syndrome. And in selected patient, uh, unilateral adrenectomy of a dominant uh, lesion is considered using individualized approach, the degree of cortisol excess, the general condition of the patient and the comorbidity and the patient preference. When we have uh, adrenal incident, adrenal mass in a children, adolescent or pregnant woman or young adult, 
we have performed urgent assessment because there is a high likelihood of malignancy in those groups. Uh, the, the management of patients with poor general health and high degree of fragility should be kept in proportion to potential clinical gain. Uh, here I would like you, I would like to share with you how to eval, uh, evaluate patients with adrenal mass and known extra adrenal malignancy. Uh, when the uh, radiological features are more toward um, uh, malignant, we can, as, uh, we can perform adrenal uh, hormonal workup and can consider individualized treatment if there is adrenal hormonal excess. Otherwise, we can manage as for primary malignancy. However, when the, there is no benign radiological feature, we should exclude fecromocytoma and regarding the other tests are individualized according to the scenario. And after excluding fecromocytoma, we can uh, either perform adrenal biopsy or resection if the pathology can alter uh, our uh, management. If not, we can manage as their uh, primary malignancy. Always we should keep in our mind the life expectancy of the patient, the stage of the primary malignancy. And in this situation, we can use FDG PET CT to exclude other metastases. I would like to tell you about the future promising tool, which is the use of urinary corticosteroid metabolism marker in differentiation between benign and malignant adrenal lesion. Studies have been shown that adrenal uh, cortical carcinoma has different uh, uh, pattern of, of urinary corticoid uh, characterized by excess of um, steroid precursor metabolite. You can see here uh, the adrenal cortical carcinoma is different from adrenal uh, cortical adenoma. Uh, finally, the last uh, slide of my presentation, I'd like to share with you uh, this uh, last study published recently with regard to the use of steroid metabolomic for differenti uh, differential diagnosis of ad adrenal incidentaloma. Uh, it is a pro uh, prospective multicenter study in 2,169 uh, adults with the newly diagnosed adrenal mass between 2011 and 2016. They assist the accuracy uh, of the diagnostic image uh, strategy based in maximum tumor diameter, more than or equal four centimeter, versus less than four centimeter, image characteristic and urine steroid metabolomic, low, medium, and high risk of adrenal cortical carcinoma, separately and in combination using reference standard and histology follow and follow-up investigation. And the finding was when the three tests were combined, the maximum tumor diameter, four centimeter or larger, um, the uh, image characteristic of, with the uh, house field unit 20 of 20, and uh, the steroid metabolic indicate high risk adrenal cortical carcinoma, the positive predictive value was 76.4% to detect adrenal cortical carcinoma. Therefore, we can conclude from this study that uh, triple test strategy in tumor diameter image characteristic and urine steroid metabolomic can improve the detection of adrenal cortical carcinoma and can short the time to surgery for a patient with adrenal cortical carcinoma and can help to avoid unnecessary surgery in patients with benign tumor. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Fatma, for the comprehensive review. It was a very interesting talk. Um, we'll move to our uh, second presenter, Dr. Reem Al Argan, a colleague from Saudi Arabia. Dr. Reem is a consultant of internal medicine and endocrine and a tumor specialist at the Department of Internal Medicine at King Fahad Hospital University at Al Khubar. She is as well assistant professor in internal medicine at College of Medicine at Imam Abdurrahman bin Faisal University in Dammam in Saudi Arabia. Um, the floor is yours, Dr. Reem. Kindly share your presentation and unmute your mic. Uh, good evening, everyone. 
thank you, Dr. Boudour, for the nice introduction, and thanks for the organizing uh, committee for the um, invitation. So I'll be presenting um, a case in relation to the theme of tonight, which is the diagnostic and therapeutic of adrenal diseases. So our case uh, will be about a patient who presented with unusual uh, cause of hypercortisolemia. We'll go over the case presentation initially, and then we'll discuss the differential diagnosis, approach of such condition, and uh, how we reach the final diagnosis. And then we'll give we'll give overview over the uh, final diagnosis in relation to its pathophysiology, clinical manifestations, uh, diagnosis, treatment, and review of uh, previously reported cases. So our patient, she is a 55-year-old uh, woman who was found to have a 3.7-centimeter uh, left adrenal mass that was discovered incidentally during evaluation of an ovarian mass. And at that time, workup was done by the um, surgical team and it showed uh, a morning cortisol of uh, 790 nanomoles per liter with a cutoff upper limit of 535. And 24-hour um, uh, urinary free cortisol was in the range of, it was done twice. One was 126 and the other one was 159 of, with upper limit of less than 120. So it was like one to 1.5 times upper limit of normal. And she had uh, normal 24-hour urine catecholamines and metanephrine. At, at that time, CT scan showed uh, 3.7 by uh, 1.6 centimeter heterogeneous left adrenal lesion. Uh, by MRI, uh, they reported uh, the mass again as heterogeneous mass with enhancement and uh, hypo-enhanced area in the posterior aspect. And they raised the possibility of either adrenal metastasis or a collagen tumor um, based on the MRI uh, finding. So since uh, the patient had suspicious uh, left ovarian mass and the MRI uh, finding was suspicious for metastasis, so the decision was to go for total abdominal uh, hysterectomy, bilateral salbingo-ophrectomy. And at the same time, she had um, uh, left adrenalectomy to be done at the same intervention. Uh, uh, the surgery was uneventful. And eventually, the uh, histopathology of both uh, the ovarian mass and the adrenal mass came to be benign. So uh, the uh, pathology of adrenal mass was reported as a 3.5 centimeter benign adrenal multinodular mass with background of adrenocortical hyperplasia. She was seen at the first time in endocrine clinic two months post-operatively. At that time, the patient was complaining of severe fatigue, anorexia, and weight loss since the time of surgery, she denied history of abdominal pain, hyperpigmentation, hypertension, postural dizziness, muscle weakness, salt craving, and headache. Um, in reviewing her past medical history, she had history of an anxiety disorder that was controlled with benzodiazepines. She had severe acne since puberty until the age of uh, 50, and she had history of hirsutism since the puberty, and that improved uh, since uh, menopause. She did not have history of hypertension, diabetes, or arthritis. Uh, in regard to her obstetric and gynecological history, she had normal pubertal development, regular menses, although she had hypomenorrhea. She had infertility, however, it was of unclear etiology. She had only one uh, pregnancy and that resulted in first trimester miscarriage. And despite having unprotected um, intercourse and severe ovarian stimulation cycles, she failed to conceive. And she had menopause at the age of 48 years. Uh, in regard to her family history, there was positive family history of infertility in her mother and maternal aunt and uncle. And uh, her grandmother, uh, mother and sister died of lupus complications. This is the family pedigree. It shows us that uh, the patient who was 55 years old, she was the only child uh, of non-consanguineous uh, uh, marriage. Uh, her mother had three uh, miscarriages. Uh, before, and the patient had one, uh, one miscarriage. And there was positive family history of infertility in her maternal aunt and maternal uncle. 
social history, uh, she had a 10 year back smoking uh, history. Uh, she is the only child of healthy and consanguineous parents of a Scottish and Irish descent. She did not have children and she was working in training with individuals uh, with uh, disabilities. Um, she had a positive allergy to penicillin and she was not on any medication other than the benzodiazepine, as I mentioned. On physical exam, she was uh, having uh, she underweight on general exam. Her vital sign, blood pressure was normal. It was 130 over 70. Heart rate was 74 per minute. Her weight was 40 with height of 156. So her BMI was 16.4 kilogram per meter square. Uh, she had her facial skin was oily with healed uh, comedonic acne scars. She had only very mild hirsutism with Fermin Galway estimated at eight. There was no striae, bruising, abnormal fat deposition or proximal muscle weakness. So in summary, she's 55 year old female. She had vast history of anxiety and infertility. She underwent left adrenalectomy for suspicious adrenal incidentaloma, which came to be benign pathology. She had high AM uh, uh, pre-op serum and urinary cortisol. She presented with severe headache, uh, sorry, severe fatigue and neuroxia with loss started since the time of surgery. She had positive family history of infertility. She was underweight on physical exam with oily skin and healed acne scars. So uh, we'll stop now and we'll take the, uh, the opinion of the audience. What do you think the most likely clinical uh, impression? Is it number one, Cushing syndrome with post-operative adrenal insufficiency, pseudo-Cushing syndrome, polycystic ovary, or congenital adrenal hyperplasia? You have uh, 15 minutes to share your thinking, and then we'll take, uh, we'll take the results of the poll question. So 41% uh, of the uh, audience think this is congenital adrenal hyperplasia. Second, 37% uh, vote for Cushing syndrome with post-operative adrenal insufficiency. And 10 to 11% think it could be pseudo-Cushing or polycystic ovary syndrome. So the initial thinking was actually that this could be a symptoms of adrenal insufficiency after an ACTH producing, uh, sorry, a cortisol producing adenoma. So um, uh, workup was done based on this clinical impression. Uh, her renal function was normal, including B1 and creatinine, sodium and potassium were both within normal. Her thyroid function was normal, prolactin was normal as well. Her gonadotropin, LH, and FSH were consistent with both menopausal uh, changes. Her AM cortisol at that time was a 364 with ACTH of 9, upper limit is 10. And she had um, ACTH stimulation just to rule out adrenal sufficiency postoperatively. And she had normal response. Zero minute was 281 and the peak was 812. So she was reassured at that time. She did well at yearly follow-ups. Three years later, she complained again, forcing chronic fatigue, loss of appetite, inability to gain weight and anxiety symptoms during that year. On exam, she was still underweight. Her blood pressure was still within normal. There was no signs of cortisol excess on examination. And she had the same findings of oily skin and uh, mild hirsutism. So uh, at that time, again, workup was done, including electrolytes, uh, uh, B1 creatinine and electrolytes were within normal. AM cortisol, again, uh, was high, it was 741. And uh, the androgens were done, including total testosterone, androstein, dion, and DHEAS, and all were within normal. Even 17 hydroxyprogesterone was done at baseline was 6.5 because, because the level was 6.5. So she had ACTH stimulation to measure the 17 hydroxyprogesterone and it peaked at only 10. So this excluded the possibility of congenital adrenal um, hyperplasia. So what do you think the best next step now at this stage? Should we go for 24 hour urinary free cortisol, overnight eight milligram dexamethasone suppression test, ACTH uh, level, or MRI uh, pituitary. Again, you have 15 questions to share us uh, your thinking at this stage. So, uh, 
So 45% um, of the audience think uh, the best step is to go for overnight 8 milligram dexamethasone suppression test. 22% think uh, it could be a 24-hour urinary free cortisol, and the rest thinks between MRI, pituitary, uh, and 21%, and ACTH level 12%. Uh, percent. So because of persistent uh, serum uh, hypercortisolemia in the morning, we uh, we elected to do further workup of, uh, of hypercortisolemia. So she had both uh, one milligram dexamethasone suppression test and 24 hour urinary free cortisol. The one milligram dexamethasone suppression test, I, it did not suppress. So the normal response should be less than 50. She had one to 27 and 24 hour urine free cortisol was done twice. And both of them were, uh, were normal around uh, in the range again of 1.5 to two times upper limit of normal. And as a second step, ACTH level uh, was done and it was 11. The normal range is less than uh, 10 becomol per uh, liter. So this is the, uh, the Endocrine Society guideline to evaluate a patient of suspected uh, Cushing. They recommend to perform first either one, any of these three tests, either 24-hour URP cortisol, overnight dexamethasone suppression test, or late night salivary cortisol. And then if any of them is abnormal, then you either repeat the same test or you do another test. So you need at least uh, two tests positive um, to, uh, to make sure that the patient is having underlying Cushing syndrome. And the second step after you confirm that the patient is having hypercortisolemia is to do ACTH level. If ACTH level is undetected, then this goes with adrenal cause. So you image the adrenal gland. However, if ACTH level is inappropriately normal or high. So this points to either ectopic or uh, pituitary uh, origin. So we have to image the, uh, the pituitary gland and then based on the finding in pituitary gland, you proceed for either surgery or inferior betrothal uh, sinus uh, sampling. So what we're having now up, at, up to this stage is evidence of ACTH-dependent hypercortisolemia, evident by high urinary cortisol, uh, unsuppressed uh, dexamethasone suppression test, persistently uh, upper range of normal of uh, ACTH level in the face of high urine cortisol and dexamethasone suppression test. So uh, we proceeded with further images. So we did the MRI of pituitary. However, it showed normal pituitary gland. And incidentally, she, she was found to have 16 millimeter right vertebral artery aneurysm. And looking for other uh, possible ectopic source of ACTH, she had CT uh, chest and abdomen. And it showed actually evidence of uh, hyperplasia of the right adrenal gland with, again, some incidental finding of small hepatic hemangioma and hepatic focal nodular hyperplasia. And looking for an uh, end organ uh, damage of hypercortisolemia, BMD was done and showed actually severe osteoporosis with evidence of uh, T-score at lumbar spine of minus 4.1 and femoral neck minus 3.3. So at this stage, we're having mixed symptoms in a patient who have baseline and anxiety disorder and infertility, and she's presenting with, and she had un underwent left adrenalectomy for incident teloma with benign pathology, presenting with uh, anorexia, fatigue, and weight loss. Clinically, she does not have symptoms of Cushing syndrome. However, we're having biochemical evidence of ACTH-mediated hypercortisolemia. Uh, on imaging, pituitary gland is within normal. We're having evidence of right adrenal hyperplasia and severe osteoporosis. So what do you think now would be the best next step at this stage? Should we repeat MRI of pituitary, consider inferior pituitary sinus sampling, send to neurosurgery for transphenoidal surgery, or uh, consider other differential diagnosis? Again, you have 15 seconds to uh, vote for this question.
So 42% uh, think we should go for uh, inferior vitreoside sinus sampling. And then 20% uh, think we should repeat MRI between 23% uh, think we should consider other differential diagnoses. And the least uh, one, 14% think we should consider uh, transphenoidal uh, surgery. So actually, uh, what we're having now is a biochemical evidence of hypercortisolemia. However, the patient is lacking a clinical signs of, of Cushing syndrome, as you, as you saw. So the differential diagnosis at this stage will be uh, either mild form of Cushing's or what is called uh, subclinical Cushing syndrome, pseudo-Cushing syndrome, increasing cortisol binding globulin, malignant Cushing syndrome, or cyclic Cushing. So we'll just go over them one by one. So starting with mild form of Cushing syndrome. So mild cases of Cushing, they present diagnostic challenge as a result of overlapping features with various other conditions. And it is characterized by subclinical autonomous hypersecretion of a glucocorticoid and most commonly find in patients with incidentally discovered adrenal masses. And the, the key to reach the diagnosis is follow up to determine whether progression occurred to over disease or not. Regarding pseudo Cushing syndrome, so it's in occurring cases where there is mild ACTH dependent hypercortisolism from conditions that are accompanied by physiologic overactivity of HPA axis, like in psychiatric disorder, anorexia nervosa, alcoholism, and uh, severe obesity and polycystic ovary syndrome. And pseudo Cushing actually to really overlap with Cushing syndrome in many aspects. Like still, you could have uh, unsuppressed exemptions on suppression tests in pseudo Cushing. You still could have high urinary free cortisol, then they may have also many features of Cushing syndrome. As was uh, reported in this review, they really, when they looked at 20 patients of pseudo Cushing, they found really overlap between uh, uh, Cushing and pseudo Cushing in many parameters. So the two main things which could help you to differentiate between both. Number one is circadian rhythm, because circadian rhythm is retained in pseudo-Cushing syndrome. However, it's lost in, uh, in Cushing. The other thing, um, CRH, uh, dexamethasone CRH testing, uh, patients who have Cushing syndrome, they usually have good cortisol uh, response to this, to this test. However, pseudo-Cushing, they usually don't uh, respond to this test. So uh, suggested a uh, test that we could use the uh, late night uh, salivary cortisol as the first screening test, uh, or we could do also the DEXA CRH to differentiate pseudo Cushing from uh, Cushing syndrome. Other causes increase in cortisol binding globulin, and that could occur in many causes like in pregnancy, drugs, or, or uh, tumors. The other possibility is malignant Cushing, and that occurs mainly in patients who have uh, a rapidly progressive uh, uh, malignancies because they will have a great catabolism. So the patient will be sick with a progressive disease, and they will not manifest the features of Cushing syndrome. The last possibility in this uh, uh, situation is the cyclic Cushing. It's a rare disorder characterized by repeated episodes of cortisol excess inter, uh, interspread by periods of normal cortisol secretion. Hypercortisolism can be regularly or irregularly uh, occur in cycles and that range from days to, uh, to years. And in review of 65 cases of cyclic Cushing, they found in 50% it arises from pituitary adenoma, 26% it could be ectopic cause, 11% it could be adrenal tumor. Majority of patients with cyclic Cushing, they have a clinical signs of Cushing syndrome, either fluctuating or permanent. Only minority, they have absent uh, signs of Cushing syndrome. And the key is you to do frequent measurement of urinary cortisol or salivary cortisol as a screening tool for suspected uh, cyclic Cushing syndrome. So for our patient, now the possibility of anorexia nervosa, major depression were excluded. She did not drink alcohol. She had never been an estrogen or selective estrogen receptor modulator. And there was no evidence of additional tumor on extensive imaging. We did sleep study. She, it, it was positive for sleep apnea. She was bought on CBAB. However, her ACTH serum cortisol and 24-hour free cortisol remained high despite appropriate treatment of sleep apnea. And her clinical picture remained stable over a uh, five-year follow-up. You can see here, this is her AM cortisol and ACTH before treatment with CBAB. And after treatment with CBAB, she still had uh, high urinary and serum cortisol with high ACTH. 
So what we're having now is a clinical evidence of hyperandrogenism in a patient who is having symptoms suggestive adrenal insufficiency in a background of personal and family history of infertility. Clinically, there are no signs of Cushing syndrome, and the patient is having biochemical evidence of hypercortisolemia with high ACTH. So the a possibility here was uh, possible glucocorticoid resistance syndrome. That's why we uh, went uh, and we did the genetic testing and came to be positive for a mutation in R3C1 gene, which is the gene that encode for glucocorticoid uh, receptor. So um, she had positive mutation in, uh, in, in R3C1 gene. She had frame shift alteration exon 4 of the 9 exon transcript, and that was predicted to be uh, pathogenic because it led to truncated protein loss of function. So the final diagnosis was glucocorticoid resistance syndrome. So just going over the, uh, the condition uh, briefly. So it was first described by George Crosses in 1982 when he reported a patient, who, two patients actually, a father and a son. The father presented with longstanding hypercortisolemia with hypertension and hypokalemia without signs of Cushing uh, syndrome. The son was asymptomatic and they confirmed the diagnosis by measuring a glucocorticoid receptor affinity to uh, dexamethasone. So glucocorticoid resistance syndrome is actually rare familial or sporadic genetic condition. It affects all organs, characterized by different degrees of target cell insensitivity to glucocorticoid. As, as a result of resistance to glucocorticoid at the peripheral tissue, patient will have loss of negative feedback on, uh, on pituitary gland, so they will have activation of HPA axis. That will result in hypersecretion of ACTH, and this will result in hypertrophy of adrenal cortex or hyper hyperplasia or adenoma, as we saw in our patient, increase the production of cortisol, adrenal androgen, precursors of mineral corticoid like the oxycorticosterone and corticosterone. So this is the normal response in uh, um, uh, hypothalamic pituitary axis. We know that uh, CRH is secreted from hypothalamus, stimulate the pituitary gland to secrete ACTH, and that will stimulate adrenal gland to uh, produce cortisol, and that will have negative feedback on hypothalamus and pituitary. However, in patients with glucocorticoid resistance syndrome, because of uh, resistance at the peripheral tissue, they will have loss of this negative feedback. So this will stimulate uh, pituitary gland to over over-secrete ACTH, and that will result in over-secretion of cortisol, deoxycorticosterone, and corticosterone at the adrenal gland, and hypersecretion of androgen as well. And this is what will result in their clinical picture. So because of high cortisol, they will present with a chronic fatigue, because of hyperandrogenemia, they will present with symptoms of hyperandrogenism like hirsutism, infertility, ambiguous genitalia, virilization. Because of high deoxycorticosterone and corticosterone, they will present with hypertension and hypokalemia, and they could present with depression and anxiety because of high CRH. And as a result, they could have either pituitary adenoma or even adrenal adenoma and hyperplasia. So the glucocorticoid receptor is actually encoded by an R3C1 gene, and that's located in the short arm of a chromosome 5, and the pattern of inheritance is actually autosomal uh, dominant. And um, this is uh, at the time when we uh, diagnosed our patient that was actually in 2018, there were a total of 43 previously reported cases, uh, and in 23 reports. Uh, and when we, you looked at their clinical picture, you find that um, most of them they present with hyperandrogenism, followed by hypertension, hypokalemia, and fatigue. Rarely, some patients presented with uh, an anxiety, adrenal adenoma, hyperplasia. Only two patients presented with severe hypoglycemia. One patient presented with uh, pituitary adenoma, and one patient presented with testicular adrenal uh, rest tumor. So uh, this is the, uh, as I mentioned, the uh, clinical manifestation, uh, which result as a result of uh, hyperandrogenism, hyperaldosteronism, uh, or other non-specific symptoms. Uh, after our case uh, report, uh, we found also four cases which were published. Uh, one patient was uh, uh, published in 2018. 
He presented similar to our patient. She presented with infertility. She had high uh, salivary cortisol and suppressed cortisol to dexamethasone and high urinary cortisol. And her sister was also positive for the same mutation, but the sister was asymptomatic. And uh, uh, the same mutation was also reported before in a previous child with hypoglycemia, hypertension, and uh, hypokalemia. Uh, this is another report after was published after our report, and, and this patient presented mainly with mild hirsutism, with elevated urinary cortisol and ACTH without signs of Cushing syndrome. Um, and uh, in 2019 and 2020, again, two more reports were, uh, were reported of the same condition. So to diagnose this patient, it will be suggested by having evidence of hypercortisolemia in the form of high serum cortisol and urinary free cortisol, which has been reported to reach up to seven to 50 fold the upper limit of normal. ACTH may be normal or high in a clinical context, so absent signs of Cushing syndrome. Uh, the patient could have suppressed cortisol to high dose dexamethasone. They will maintain their circadian rhythm. So if you do late night salivary cortisol, it will be normal. And of course, the definitive testing is by genetic testing. Now the treatment, the goal is to reduce the excess ACTH and by that you will suppress the high androgens and high mineralocorticoid. And that could be achieved by giving high doses of mineralocorticoid sparing synthetic glucocorticoids like dexamethasone, you could give one to three milligram and the dose is carefully titrated according to the clinical manifestation and biochemical profile of the patient. So, so we expect that treatment of, with dexamethasone will ameliorate their clinical manifestation will normalize their concentration of plasma ACTH and androgen and will reduce the risk of adrenal adenoma and testicular adrenal rest tumor. Aldosterone antagonists may be particularly helpful also in those patients to treat their hypertension and has another advantage that it has anti-androgen effect. So would you treat this patient with uh, dexamethasone or not? We could uh, uh, take your uh, uh, view on this question. Is it yes, no, or, uh, or not sure? Again, you have 15 seconds to complete this question. So 66% they said that they think they will uh, treat this patient with dexamethasone. Actually, if you look at the advantages and disadvantages of treating this patient with dexamethasone, uh, it will improve her hyperandrogenism symptoms. So it will improve the hirsutism. It will reduce the chance that she should develop adrenal adenoma in the future and pituitary adenomas. However, we know that she has severe osteoporosis and that may worsen her osteoporosis, may worsen her cardiovascular risk and may increase the risk of calciuria and the risk of infection. Infection. And we know that in patients, even patients who have glucocorticoid resistance syndrome or e even other resistance syndromes, they could have variable tissue sensitivity to their hormone. And specifically, glucocorticoid was shown that the its sensitivity differ not only among individuals, but also within the tissues of the same individual. So it and also it varies within the same cell during the cell cycle. So tissue-specific glucocorticoid resistance frequently develop also in patients who are on a chronic glucocorticoid therapy. So um, what about the osteoporosis and vascular abnormalities? Uh, severe osteoporosis have, and vascular abnormalities have, been, have not been previously reported before in association with glucocorticoid uh, syndrome, resistance syndrome. However, we, uh, there was evidence before that vascular malformation could occur due to the effect of hypercortisolemia on the blood vessels. And it was shown in mice that injection of hydrocortisone could result to, uh, in induction of ectasia and aneurysm. So evidence of cerebral aneurysm could be related to her hypercortisolemia. So in our patient, we actually opted not to use dexamethasone and that because uh, she did not have evidence of mineralocorticoid excess. And we were afraid that the dexamethasone would aggravate her severe osteoporosis, assuming that she had a lesser degree of insensitivity to glucocorticoids on her bone. She underwent coiling of her cerebral aneurysm and she was last seen in 2018. She was doing well at that time. She was in donosumab for osteoporosis, osteoporosis, calcium and vitamin D. Blood pressure remained normal and her BMI remained at around 16 and she had no acne with same degree of hirsutism. 
So in conclusion, increasing awareness of a clinical heterogeneity of a primary glucocorticoid resistance may result in uncovering more cases of this syndrome. Clinicians need to consider it whenever they face ACTH-dependent hypercortisolemia without evidence of Cushing syndrome, especially if it is associated with adrenal adenoma or hyperplasia, hyperandrogenism, and or uh, mineral corticoid excess. Our case questioned the wisdom of recommending treatment with ACTH, reducing doses of dexamethasone to all patients, and we think that individualized approach to this treatment seems uh, more appropriate. If you uh, need more uh, information, you could refer to our uh, case report. It was reported in the Clinical Journal in 2018. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Reem. That was really a very interesting case and a challenging as well. Uh, before uh, moving to our our uh, third presenter, just to remind the audience that this is a CME accredited activity by uh, Dubai Health Authority and it's a sponsored activity by Servia. For any of the attendees who have a question, you can always post it in the Q&A box and the questions will be addressed toward the end of the session. So far, we have above 400 attendees. Thank you all for joining us for our academic activity of tonight. So uh, without further delay, we move to Dr. Rashid Mustafa. Dr. Rashid is a very senior specialist radiologist at Dubai Hospital, working with the Dubai Health Authority since 2003. He has work experience of over 24 years in the field of the radiology. Dr. Rashid will give us a talk of adrenal image made easy. If the Russia, the floor is yours. Kindly share your presentation and unmute your mic. Assalamu alaikum and good evening to all the attendees. Thanks a lot, Dr. Budur, for the invitation. And thanks to Dr. Fatma and Dr. Reem for the excellent lecture this evening. Today evening, the talk would be about the incident loma in adrenal imaging that we encounter in our routine imaging practice. The adrenal gland is made up of cortex and medulla. It's a common site for primary both functional and non-functional tumors and metastasis. The workup for the adrenal masses will depend upon the patient's clinical scenario and whether de detection or characterization of the primary is the primary goal of imaging. The workup of the adrenal masses are divided into three algorithms that is the characterization of the incidental adrenal masses in patients with no underlying malignancy, detection and characterization of incidental adrenal mass with a patient of primary known malignant neoplasm and detection of a adrenal tumor in a patient with biochemical abnormality. The learning objectives would be to provide overview for the evaluation of the adrenal masses in various clinical scenarios, to give an understanding of the various imaging techniques available to detect and characterize adrenal masses and to understand the differentiating features between benign and malignant adrenal masses. Among all the imaging modalities, CT and MRI and to some extent PET scans are the cornerstone of imaging. Ultrasound, not the imaging of choice, it's operator dependent, it's a very good tool in infants and children, but in adults, CT and MR are the preferred modality of investigation. CT gives us a good idea about the nature and size of the lesion. It's useful in the workup in malignancy cases and in estimating the renal wash-off to determine the type of the lesion. The only drawback is that it's using an ionizing radiation and contrast. The dedicated CT protocol includes the densitometry of the mass on non-contrast CT scan. 
Measuring the unenhanced value of the adrenal masses is important for lipid-rich adenomas. And any unenhanced uh, value of less than 10 Hounsfield unit is a characteristic of benign mass and no further imaging evaluation is normally required. Use of uh, contrast enhanced washout values helps distinguish uh, from, a benign, from a benign to a malignant lesions. The adrenal washout that we uh, values that we use is absolute uh, enhancement washout where we take the en enhanced uh, attenuation value minus delayed attenuation value divided by enhanced attenuation value minus uh, an enhanced attenuation value. This gives us a good sensitivity of, and specificity in diagnosing benign adrenal adenomas. However, there is one pit. There are few pitfalls of this, and the pitfalls are that uh, within these adenoma range, there is uh, adrenal metastasis, few chromocytomas, and adrenal cort cortical carcinomas may overlap. Their 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 washout values may overlap leading to uh, leading to pitfalls in the diagnosis mri is an excellent tool due to its multiplanar imaging capability however the examination is time time consuming and expensive adrenal lesions are pretty common and uh, classification of uh, incident lomas are classified into indeterminate lesions between 1 to 4 centimeters and indeterminate lesions more than 4 centimeters. All 3% uh, of all CD examinations we get incidental lomas and it's a challenge to differentiate between the nine and or a malignant primary or metastatic adrenal lesion. Lesions 1 to 2 cm in patients without cancer history are probably benign and we consider a 12 months follow up. In other indeterminate lesions, performing a dedicated adrenal CT or MRI to diagnose uh, lipid poor adenomas is needed. If we diagnose lipid poor adenomas, there is no need to follow for follow up. This is the uh, chart for from the Springer diseases of abdominal and pelvis for the diagnosis of the. Uh, incident lomas how we go about diagnosing them how do we do go about uh, doing a workup for them if the lesion is uh, more than four centimeters uh, it, sorry if the lesion is less than four centimeter in diameter indeterminate there is no cancer history consider resection because the possibility of adrenal carcinoma no biopsy if there is a cancer history then consider pet or biopsy Masses which are less than one centimeter, they they are typically benign. They mirage cyst. Uh, in these the lesions, which are long term unchanged lesions and lesions which do not enhance. Seventy percent of the adenomas contain high intracellular fat and will be of low attenuation on an enhanced CT scan. Density equal to a bo less than ten Hounsfield unit is con is diagnostic of lipid rich adenomas safe threshold value of 10 Hounsfield unit on a normal CT scan results in a sensitivity of 70 to 79 percent and high specificity for diagnosis of adenomas MRI is used to diagnose lipid rich adenomas in phase sequences show how high signal whereas there is a loss of signal on out phase uh, imaging denoting lipid rich content this is the in phase and out phase if you we have a look in the in phase there is a high signal which loses out the signal loses out in the out phase suggesting that this is a lipid rich adenoma myelolipomas are benign tumors composed of bone marrow elements they're easy to recognize on ct and mr because they contain areas of macroscopic fat and some of them may have calcification this is a 
a typical example of myelolipoma, a, C, uh, a CT scan, contrast enhanced, showing uh, fat attenuation uh, lesion with some soft tissue components. MRI high signal on T1 and loss of signal on uh, out phase imaging. Cysts are, uh, are fat density lesions. They ha may have thin walls and septa. Endothelial cysts or pseudocysts are the common cysts that are there. Hemorrhage and debris may cause increased uh, internal attenuation within the cysts. However, some benign and malignant tumors may also show cystic degeneration and necrosis. However, in these cases, the walls may be thick, irregular, and may show septal and solid component enhancement. This is an example of a benign cyst, well defined on the left adrenal gland. Lesions with calcification are found in adenomas, myelolipomas, hemorrhage, granulomatous infection. If the lesions are bilateral, they are mostly benign. Punctate and dystrophic calcifications may also be seen in adrenal cortical cancer and adrenal metastasis. A typical example of a granulomatous infection on the right side showing bilateral adrenal calcifications. One to four centimeter uh, lesions, then uh, if there is a washout or signal drop, then it's a lipid poor adenoma and we do a 6 to 12 months follow up. No washout, then possibility of pheochromocytoma, adrenal cortical carcinoma, metastasis, and lipid poor adenomas are there. We do an imaging follow up, a biopsy, PET CT scan, or resection depending upon the clinical scenario as recommended. Lipid poor adenomas are 30% of all adrenal, 30 percent of all adrenal adenomas do not contain intracellular lipid to have a density of less than 10 ounce field unit and cannot be differentiated from non-adenomas on an enhanced CT scan. They are diagnosed, diagnosed with dedicated adrenal CT to look for fast washout. And MRI of uh, MRI out of phase imaging show lipid poor adenomas uh, contain enough microscopic fat to cause a signal drop in out of phase imaging compared to in phase imaging due to chemical shift artifacts. Out of out of phase imaging showing signal dropout showing signal dropout as compared to the in phase imaging suggesting lipid poor adenoma pheochromocytomas follow a 10% rule 10% extradrenal bilateral malignant in children familial not associated with hypertension they are sporadic and are often associated with multiple endocrine neoplasias, Weber syndrome, tuberous sclerosis, etc. They are large heterogeneous masses with areas of necrosis, cystic change, and show intense enhancement. In patients with suspected pheochromocytomas, contrast is given with caution as they may present uh, precipitate a hypertensive crisis. MR is a much better uh, imaging modality. They, they are hyper intense on T2, a light bulb sign, which is one of the diagnostic criteria for the uh, pheochromocytomas on MRI. MIBG scanning also shows abnormal uptake. These are the cases of pheochromocytomas where there are, is intense enhancement in post contrast imaging and CT scan. And another case showing cystic changes within the pheochromocytoma. Adrenal metastasis, the primary sites from where the adrenal metastasis come are lung cancer, uh, both the small cell as well as non-small cell breast uh, cancers, renal, bowel, ovary and melanomas. The radiographic features are they are often have irregular margins, often bilateral, show heterogeneous enhancement, and are seen with a known primary. Lesions which are more than four centimeters in size, if there is no history of cancer, then consider resection. How when history of cancer, PET CT or biopsy is advisable. 
adrenal uh, lesion more than 4 cm size normally uh, adrenal uh, one of the uh, commonest cause, uh, causes are adrenal cortical carcinomas they present as functioning tumors uh, Cushing syndrome is one of the most common presenting features most tumors are more than 5 cm at the time of diagnosis they show areas of necrosis hemorrhage and calcification which may be punctate patchy irregular at the time of discovery they may spread to adjacent organs and regional lymph nodes and they often show ivc and renal vein invasion in around 10 to 20 percent of cases the imaging fit, uh, pitfalls in are uh, very rarely adrenal cortical carcinomas may have a small areas of macroscopic fat and the um, uh, the washout values are sometimes equivalent to adenomas leading to misdiagnosis as adrenal adenomas more than half of the patients will have a stage 3 or stage 4 disease at the time of diagnosis leading to a low uh, survival rate it's important for the radiologist to look at the adjacent organ invasion for the lymph node and distant metastasis commonly which goes to lung liver and bone a typical example of adrenal cortical uh, carcinoma a bulky large tumor showing heterogeneous enhancement with enhancing capsule The MR in adrenal lesion is used as a pro problem solver after inconclusive CT scan or if contrast enhanced CT is contraindicated. MR protocol should include chemical shift imaging with an in phase and out phase sequences to detect the intracellular fat, a fat suppressed sequence to detect macroscopic fat, T2 images to diagnose cystic or, uh, cysts, cystic component and may help in diagnosing pheochromocytoma because of classic light bulb sign. Dynamic gadolinium enhanced MR is helpful to differentiate adenomas from non-adenomas and pheochromocytomas are identified because of their intense enhancement. Diffusion imaging um, in uh, adrenal have got no value in differentiating benign from malignant masses. Lastly, PET CT imaging in adrenal uh, lesion, the malignant tumors have a higher glucose metabolism than benign tumors. And this enables the glucose analog of 18 FDG to be taken up by the malignant lesions. FDG is not specific for any certain adrenal tumor but can be used to differentiate pheochromocytomas, paragangliomas, adrenal cortical carcinomas and adrenal metastasis from benign tumors. PET-CT imaging is also helpful in evaluation of distant and lymph nodal metastasis in adrenal cortical carcinomas with a very high degree of sensitivity. An example of a adrenal cortical carcinoma showing distant metastasis into liver and to bony metastasis to the vertebral column. Normal uh, physio high uh, physiological uptake is seen in this spleen and bubble. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Rashid, for this interesting presentation and uh, review of the adrenal images. So um, now we are toward the Q&A session. I would like to invite the panelists to this sessions, and we'll start with the questions. Okay, so uh, prior to starting the question, just for the uh, uh, attendees who are asking about the download of the presentations, you can find them on the ADS website uh, on demand, plus on uh, ADS YouTube channel. So we'll start with the first question. Okay. Uh, the question is posted to Dr. Fatma uh, for how long we need to follow up patients with adrenal uh, incidentalomas. 
I think it will depend on uh, the uh, the functional status. Uh, for example, a patient with the autonomous cortisol secretion, uh, we have uh, to follow them uh, up to four to five years, um, and uh, who are hormonally active. And uh, in general, um, four to five years uh, also in non function recommended by uh, some uh, guideline. However, it will be like individualized uh, uh, approach according also to the patient age and uh, the clinical scenario. Uh, some people will not stop uh, after five years. Uh, they will prefer to do further follow up. So I think it is like uh, it's, it is uh, individualized uh, case by case. Okay. Uh, I'll go to the second question for you also, Dr. Fatma. Uh, what is the size of the growth during the follow-up image that you would consider significant and you would refer the patient for surgical intervention? Okay, uh, usually uh, benign mass uh, is not show significant growth due the interval of six to 12 months. There is no clear uh, evidence cut of size uh, uh, with regard uh, uh, suspicious of malignancy. However, uh, the current guideline, as I mentioned, the European guideline, uh, they were recommending uh, more than five uh, millimeter or 20% of largest tumor diameter uh, growth, uh, significant to refer for surgery. Uh, the the re recent Korean guideline 2017, also they recommend zero, uh, 0 0.5 to one centimeter growth. Uh, significant to uh, growth to refer uh, for surgery. Uh, okay, we we'll go to the rest of the questions. We have here a question for uh, Dr. Reem. Uh, regarding your case for the glucocorticoid resistance syndrome, what is the role of potassium sparing diuretics in such patients? So uh, because we know those patients could present with, um, with hypertension, so uh, number one management, of course, will be uh, dexamethasone to uh, suppress ACTH, and as a result, you will suppress the androgens and mineralocorticoid. However, if that's not enough to control the patient hypertension and hypokalemia, we could use potassium sparing diuretics for both uh, controlling hypertension, and at the same time, it has the advantage of um, anti-androgen effect, so it will help you also in regards to their uh, hyperandrogenism symptoms as well. Okay, so first line DEXA, second line blood pressure, you can use the diuretics. The second question is also posted for you, Dr. Reem. Uh, are there reported cases of such case in the Gulf? Uh, as far as I uh, know, and even in our review, when we published the case, and even after we, uh, um, after uh, during my review um, for the cases that were published after our case, there was no uh, previously reported cases in the Gulf region. Most of them were uh, either in the U.S. or in European region. However, there was no uh, previously reported cases in in the Gulf area. But uh, the, the aim actually for presenting this case is to uh, keep this uh, potential diagnosis in our mind. And that uh, will result in uncovering most cases of this syndrome, because unless we look for it, we won't have uh, diagnosed cases in this region. So if it's not considered, it could be overlooked and missed. Yes. Okay. Uh, Arim, another question for you regarding the syndrome. Uh, role of genetic counseling once it's positive? Yeah. So, of course, it is indicated. As I said, it is inherited in autosomal dominant fashion. So, uh, uh, it is indicated to, uh, to do genetic counseling for the patient, and that will result in diagnosing those patients early. So, you could uh, um, avoid surgeries for those patients. As you know, as in our patient, she presented initially with adrenal adenoma, and she underwent uh, surgery for that adenoma. Mm -hmm. So, if those patients diagnosed early that you could uh, you could um, uh, prevent those unnecessary surgery and you could treat their uh, their symptoms early without being missed for for long period of time in our patient we actually uh, um, proposed for her the genetic counseling but um, uh, she refused to to do the genetic counseling for the rest of her family okay 
there is a question for Dr. Rashid is uh, from our colleague. What's your opinion about MRI adrenal for follow up for cases of low to intermediate risk of adrenal incidentalomas? Is it superior to contrast CT, especially to avoid the radiation hazard? Yes, ma'am. Uh, the um, thanks, Dr. Fozia. Uh, this uh, uh, MR is definitely superior than CT scan because uh, it uh, first of all it will not give radiation. There is no radiation involved. Second of all, we get to see in an incident loma low grade, uh, low risk. We uh, expect to find more fat and uh, other things. So in phase imaging, out phase imaging fat suppressed imaging they all can uh, give us a much better idea about the nature of the lesion and uh, about follow up it's only the uh, issue about since the examination takes a longer time and uh, the patient is uh, at times not uh, does not uh, uh, um, uh, it prefers getting CT scan which takes a much shorter time as compared to MR that is the reason why we are doing a lot of CT scans compared to doing MR for adrenal lesions time just time related issues otherwise MRI is superior yeah, MRI is, um, is much better if you look at my slide I image I the first line that I said was that MR is a problem solver Okay. So you've already answered the question of our colleague, uh, Dr. Saad. She asked, which is better, CT or MRI? Okay, we go to the rest of the questions. Uh, this question is posted to Dr. Fatima. Uh, where, uh, if the patient who's going for adrenal surgery is a diabetic patient, is there any special considerations? Uh, well, I think uh, we uh, we need uh, good uh, blood sugar control uh, for uh, all patients who will go for surgery, uh, especially uh, patients who have uh, adrenal incidentaloma with uh, autonomous cortisol secretion when we will use like steroid coverage. Uh, which will make uh, the blood sugar, uh, sugar higher. So we should make sure that we uh, also uh, uh, control the blood sugar uh, very well before uh, going for surgery. Okay. So the standard uh, diabetes perioperative care for such yeah. patients. Yeah. Uh, there is another question posted uh, to Dr. Reem. Uh, does it worth doing genetic testing for patients suspected to have glucocorticoid resistance syndrome with a positive family history? Or since it is a rare disease, uh, better to exclude other causes before consider going to uh, genetic testing? Uh, the question is about a patient who already have positive family history. Yes. The role of, of genetic uh, counseling. So once the patient is uh, one index case, for example, is diagnosed in the family, so we need to screen other other family members, uh, and that's uh, that's the idea of uh, of diagnosing those patients early, as we mm -hmm. did earlier. Uh, however, if uh, if a patient does not have family history, then the story is different. Of course, you have to go through other differential as we discussed, and if all are negative, then you will do the genetic uh, testing. But of course, if there is positive family history, we have to screen the family members for the disease. First degree is enough for screening? Yes, first degree relative to start with, yes. Okay. And if you, if you look at the previous reports, most of the reports were reporting either one or two family members uh, um, in the same report because they, when, once they diagnose the patient, they, they do the family screening at the same time. So they report at least two cases maybe in the same, uh, in the same report. Okay. Thanks, Dr. Reem. We, uh, there is another question uh, to uh, Dr. Fatma, pregnant two months. Um, going as planned for adrenal surgery due to uh, malignancy of the adrenal. When would you advise to go for the surgery and is it wise to wait until delivery, especially in case of uh, precious baby? 
I think uh, in case of a pregnancy, if uh, a surgery recommended uh, to be done, it should be in uh, the second trimester. Uh, this is what I know. Uh, but whether if it is uh, because of its uh, baby and delaying the operation, I think it will be like uh, the MDT discussion and the, toward the benefit and the risk uh, of delaying surgery. Jen, so any complex cases of adrenal better to have a multidisciplinary team? Yeah. I th oh, uh, according to the recommend uh, recent recommendation, any adrenal mass will refer for surgery. Sh we should discuss it in the MDT. Okay, let's see. Uh, another question to you, uh, Dr. Fatma. This is a medical legal question. When can I discharge a patient with adrenal uh, adenoma that is mostly benign? without any uh, medical legal liability? I think uh, I, uh, I mentioned uh, regarding the European Society of Endocrinology recommendation that no further uh, imaging, uh, if it is uh, clearly benign, less than four centimeter, uh, homogeneous house field unit, less than 10, no further image, and if it's hormonally active, uh, no hormonal workup, uh, unless uh, no clinical sign or symptom appear. However, uh, I think also this is uh, will depend on uh, the physician and the case and the age of the patient. Uh, so some physician will not uh, discharge uh, people, even if it's clearly benign, they will prefer to follow up them uh, for uh, like a certain year, uh, especially in young uh, people. Uh, I, I mentioned that the risk of malignant transformation of benign uh, adenoma is very low, uh, and the reported cases uh, of malignant transformation are very few. Uh, however, still there is a risk of malignant uh, transformation. Thank you, Dr. Fatma. Um, okay, there is a question about uh, renal impairment in case of adrenal incidentaloma. What's the best uh, image modality and what about the contrast in such cases? Is the, is the question for me? Uh, yes, Dr. Fatma. Sorry, yeah, the question is for you. For adrenal incidentaloma with renal impairment, what would you recommend as a high sensitivity imaging modality? And what about the contrast in such case? I think uh, I will go by MR. So uh, uh, MRI. I don't know if Dr. Rashid have uh, other suggestions. Now, in such yeah. cases, we will definitely go with MR. And uh, if... Uh, there is any issues regarding if, if there is high uh, creatinine then we definitely cannot give mr contrast however if there is any uh, doubt or any problems then we can come back to ct scan and take clearance from nephrologist and go ahead with a contrast ct scan for any issues regarding uh, distant metastasis uh, any other lesions uh, that we have because definitely uh, the value of contrast both in CT and MR cannot be uh, overlooked. So the standard is to go for MRI, otherwise high risk yeah. consult with nephrology consultation. Okay. Yeah. Um, thank you very much uh, for the panelists for, for your participation, the questions. We have further questions, but um, we are running out of time, so we have to go to the... Uh, Just to quote, ma'am, ma MR uh, gives us a very good idea about tissue differentiation. So MR will give you, uh, will differentiate a lesion, a mass from a normal adrenal tissue. So you will pick up the lesion, you will know that there is a lesion much, much uh, clearly than a CT scan, a non-contrast CT scan. Okay, so... It's only when there is any doubt regarding that lesion that we go back to a CT scan with contrast and do it. That is the whole crux of how to uh, manage the lesion. Uh, thank you very much no to all of you. That was an interesting discussion. Now we have to move to our uh, fourth presenter, uh, Dr. Khadija Hafid. 
So this is a sponsored presentation by Servia. Uh, Dr. Khadija Hafal will present today self-ureas in current practice, review of data and new uh, real world evidence. Dr. Khadija, she's a consultant uh, physician and head of diabetes unit at Department of Internal uh, Medicine at Rashid Hospital at Dubai Health Authority. She's also a member of the steering committee for the UAE National Diabetes Guidelines. She's a SCOP certified obesity expert. Uh, the floor is yours, Dr. Khadija. Kindly share your Thank presentation you. and unmute your mic. I will do so. Thank you so much, Dr. Badur, for that very kind introduction. And let me just sort of share my screen. And all right, uh, give me a thumbs up if you're able to see it. Yeah, we can see your presentation, but if you put okay. it on, it's uh, on power, yes, okay. How about then? Yeah, we can see. All right, excellent. All right, that's good. We've got the technical things out of the way. So once again, thank you so much, Dr. Badur, for the kind introduction and uh, to the organizers for inviting me uh, to give this talk. Um, I know it's uh, getting on towards um, uh, the end of the day. You've already had an exciting two hours of discussions on the adrenals. And uh, what I'd like to do is um, sort of change focus and bring you back to um, diabetes a little bit and... Um, uh, my task is really to review some uh, new world um, evidence data with regards to the use of um, sulfonylureas um, in our current practice. So those are my disclosures. And uh, you're all a sophisticated audience, uh, well aware that we've got a very high prevalence of type 2 diabetes um, in the region. But what is um, uh, equally um, alarming is the fact that um, a very small percentage of our patients actually achieve um, target uh, glycemic control. And as you can see from the uh, figure here, um, glycemic control usually just ranges from about um, 11 to 41 percent. So um, there's still a lot of work that needs to be done. Now, when we are thinking about diabetes uh, management, the goals of care are really um, focused around the patient to prevent the long-term complications and optimize the quality of life. And we've also um, come to agree um, in the consensus that the approach um, to a glycemic target needs to be very individualized. There are a number of factors um, that we need to take into consideration. Um, I've listed them um, here, taken from the American Diabetes um, Association Standards of Care. And um, one may aim for a more stringent target of less than 7%, depending on the disease duration, depending on uh, the patient preference, resources, and support. And likewise, you may aim for a less stringent um, target um, in a frail elderly patient, for instance, who has a, um, a shorter life expectancy and um, a lot of important comorbidities. So when we look at uh, the factors that are important in reducing cardiovascular risk, and listed here are quite a few of them, but what this slide highlights is the fact that hemoglobin A1C control, so glycemic control, still stands out as an important factor in trying to reduce cardiovascular risk. And so we've already mentioned the fact that um, A1C needs to be very individualized. And we know that for most patients, um, metformin monotherapy is not going to get them to their hemoglobin A1C target, and therefore they will need to have additional therapy. So now in patients that do not have atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, the two most common um, drugs that we use in clinical practice are the sulfonylureas and the DPP-4 um, inhibitors. And these are uh, the usual sort of options that we have following um, metformin. And as you can see, the um, evolution of uh, the management of type 2 diabetes has really taken um, over a, a century, one would say. The sulfonylureas we've had for over half a century, so they, were, uh, they came into um, clinical practice um, just before the 1950s and 
um, these agents um, have evolved over time. Whereas the DPP-4 inhibitors, um, we've had them in clinical use for almost about a decade now. So if we look at uh, a network meta-analysis that included 75 randomized controlled trials, we can appreciate that the sulfonylurea is amongst um, the most effective oral glucose lowering agents. You can get a reduction of hemoglobin A1C in the range of 1.3% um, uh, almost compared to say the SGLT2 inhibitors or the DPP4 inhibitors um, as highlighted here. And if we look at a uh, cohort, um, and this is a study from the UK and uh, Germany, um, looking at the most common second line treatments, as, was, as I've mentioned earlier, the SUs and the DPP4 inhibitors um, are the most commonly um, used agents. Um, and the reason that glycoside is used so commonly is because we've had it for you know, over half a century. Um, glycoside MR um, has shown in the advanced trial that you can get to hemoglobin A1C targets um, of close to 6.5% uh, with the added benefit of even reduction in microvascular events, especially the renal um, events quite safely. And on the other hand, um, we've known now um, that the DPP-4 inhibitors um, as a class, and here I'll use the example of citagliptin, they've got a good safety pro, uh, profile with minimal risk of hypoglycemia. However, we don't have any sort of head-to-head um, -head trials that have looked at the efficacy um, and the rates of hypoglycemia between these two um, class of, um, of agents. And therefore, um, it was the group from Leicester, headed by Kamlesh Kunti, Melanie Davis, and, um, and colleagues, who actually sought out to look at this comparative effectiveness between um, glycoside, um, MR, with citagliptin as a prototype of the DPP-4 inhibitors, and look at the effectiveness um, and the safety as a second line agent after metformin monotherapy in patients with type two diabetes who haven't reached their hemoglobin A1C targets. Um, and this is a, um, a recent publication in Diabetes, Obesity and, Met and Metabolism um, that came about in August um, of this year. So just to highlight what is the difference between a randomized controlled trial and real world evidence, there are a number of variables that differentiate these studies. And the purpose of an RCT is obviously we're looking at efficacy and here we're looking at the um, efficacy in a controlled environment. Whereas in a real world evidence, we're able to see the effectiveness of the intervention in usual practice. So the setting for an RCT is usually experimental, whereas um, for real world, it is the usual care. And therefore, follow-up in a randomized controlled trial is usually designed and follows a protocol. The treatment pattern is usually fixed, whereas for a real world um, evidence uh, study, it may be quite variable. And then when we look at the study groups, it's a very homogeneous uh, group when we come to randomized controlled trials because you have a specific um, um, inclusion criteria, whereas in the real world, it will be very heterogeneous. The attending physician in the case of a, a randomized controlled trial is referred to as an investigator, whereas in the real world, you may have many practitioners um, of different specialities uh, looking after the same patient. More importantly, when we're looking at the comparator in a randomized controlled trial, it might either be a placebo a select, or a selected um, uh, comparator, um, whereas in real world data, we're looking at many alternative um, interventions. So what was the aim of uh, this particular um, study that was done by the Leicester group? So they wanted to compare the effectiveness and the safety of glycoside modified release to citagliptin as a second line um, agent in uh, patients with type two diabetes. So the primary outcome was to look at the time it takes um, to get to a hemoglobin, C, a, a hemoglobin A1C target that's less than 7%. And they had a number of other secondary outcomes as well, which included uh, the time it takes to get to an A1C target that's less than 6.5, and the time it takes to reduce 
the um, hemoglobin A1C by more than 1% from the baseline. And they also wanted to study the um, durability and persistence by looking at the treatment duration and to, of course, compare for hypoglycemic um, events. Where was the data derived? It came from a clinical practice research uh, data link, which was a conglomerate of uh, GP practices across the UK. Um, and then what they did was uh, they looked at uh, new users of glycoside MR or citagliptin um, at the beginning of uh, January of 2010, because as you, as you recall, the DPP-4 inhibitors became available at around that time. And then they were able to um, have an observation period of about nine years to assess the hemoglobin A1C, the durability, and the presence of hypoglycemic events. So who was included um, in the analysis? Patients with type 2 diabetes that were above the age of 18. Um, they had to be on metformin therapy as first line. They had to have hemoglobin A1Cs above 7% in the six months before entry into the trial and uh, the presence of uh, 12 months of historical data prior to be included in the trial. So this was a study that was looking primarily at type 2 diabetes and therefore anybody with type 1 diabetes or any other specific diabetes such as gestational, neonatal or secondary diabetes was excluded um, from the study. Now, in terms of the statistical methods, they used what was referred to as a high dimensional propensity score in order to match the patients that were initiated on glycoside MR as opposed to those that were started on citagliptin. And then the new users of glycoside MR were matched to new users of citagliptin with a fixed ratio of one to one. And then they looked at um, the durability and persistence using the log rank uh, test and also um, looking for the incidence of hypoglycemic events. So uh, when uh, they looked at the database, they had over 45,000 patients that were eligible, but then after excluding those with missing data, those with other um, exclusion criteria, they were left with about 6, 000, um, over 6,000 patients which uh, were then divided into around 1,000 that were on glycoside and more than 5,000 on citagliptin. But when they did the propensity matching, because it had to be equally matched, we ended up with a population of well, just under 1,000 in the glycoside MR group and um, a similar number in the citagliptin group as well. So let's look at their baseline characteristics. Um, roughly 60% uh, were male and uh, their mean age was around 63 years. Uh, they had suboptimal glycemic control with hemoglobin A1Cs at 8.5%. They were an obese population with a, a mean BMI of 30 and they had a short duration of diabetes of approximately four years. Majority of them had other comorbidities. Um, you can see that almost 60% um, of this population had high blood pressure. Um, about 15% uh, also had uh, evidence of microvascular complications in the form of retinopathy and kidney disease. So then let's look at the results of the primary outcome, which was the time to achieve a hemoglobin A1C target that's less than seven. And you can see that there was a very clear separation of the curves that um, occurred at around three months um, of um, initiating these therapies. And therefore, um, when you look at um, the data, you can see that about 35% um, of, of the patients that were exposed to glycoside MR had a um, higher chance of achieving the hemoglobin A1C target of less than 7% compared to those patients that were on um, citagliptin. And then if we look at those that were able to achieve the hemoglobin A1C target less than 6.5%, you can see that there was a 50% more likely uh, chance of uh, those that were on glycoside MR as opposed to those that were on citagliptin. Then when we look at uh, the time to achieve the hemoglobin A1C reduction of more than 1% from their baseline, um, the difference was much smaller, but um, also significant with 11% more likely to reduce A1C with glycoside MR compared to citagliptin. 
What about the durability and persistence? It was almost um, superimposed, as you can see there from, um, from the um, curves. So there was really no difference in terms of the durability and, and the persistence in therapy. So the time to achieve um, uh, a hemoglobin A1C target that's less than 7% uh, was um, much higher in the patients that were actually initiated on glycolyzide MR um, as opposed to citagliptin. And that difference um, did not vary um, depending on the duration of the diabetes. It was almost um, uh, the similar between the two um, arms. Now, you might ask, those uh, that were exposed to glycolyzide MR, they had um, a higher reduction in, in uh, many more had a, a higher reduction in the hemoglobin A1C, but did it come at the expense of uh, more hypoglycemia? And as you can see from the table here, for both the groups, there were very, very um, low uh, incidence of hypoglycemic events. Um, a little bit more obviously in the glycoside MR group, but not that different um, from those that were on the citagliptin group as well for, very, for um, severe hypoglycemic events. So then what this study um, has actually highlighted is that the use of um, sulfonylurea, particularly glycoside MR, because this was the um, agent that was um, uh, studied in, 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 in this database, uh, it's extremely effective in getting patients to their glycemic targets. And as we recall, um, getting patients to um, the hemoglobin A1C is important also in reducing their cardiovascular risk and reducing microvascular um, complications. And more importantly, this was um, not done um, at the expense of having more hypoglycemic um, uh, events. And in fact, we have a treatment that's quite um, durable and persistent, um, despite the duration of, um, of the disease. Um, and with that, um, I think I would like to thank you all for your attention, and would be more than happy to take any questions if there are any. So let me go back to the, right. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Khadija, for this nice talk and the review of the real world evidence of SUs. So despite the emergence of new medications for diabetes, still the SUs play a good part and, and they are still maintaining their durability and sustain sustainability. Absolutely. But for my, my question is like, yes. uh, from your experience and the real world evidence data, for how long before you, you need, uh, for how long they will maintain their sust sustainability and durability uh, without adding any further agents? Right, so for those, uh, there have been studies that were done previously. Um, and if I remember correctly, there are patients who can go up to 10 years on metformin and, um, and sulfonylurea. Um, able to maintain their um, glycemic uh, targets. Um, and we're talking about, of course, uh, in, in the treatment guidelines, these are patients that do not have atherosclerotic um, cardiovascular disease um, because we do know now that if a patient does have either CKD or heart failure or atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, you need to initiate um, the newer agents such as S SGLT2 inhibitors or the GLP-1s. But for the large majority of the patients, which would be about 70% of the populations that, uh, um, of, of diabetics that we see in clinical practice, um, we're still able um, to maintain glycemic um, control from roughly six to 10 years without you know, having to add additional therapy. Having said that, it is also important you know, to make sure that we don't delay intensification of, um, of therapy. So if the patient is more than one, more than 2% um, on, on their gly glycemic target, um, we shouldn't be waiting uh, you know, uh, for months to years in order to, to intensify. As much as possible, what is really important is to get um, patients to goal as safely as, um, as we can. 
That's a yeah. great period. Uh, there are a couple of questions posted to you, uh, Dr. Khadija. Mm -hmm. uh, first, uh, hypoglycemia is documented to have less uh, and seta glyptin compared to glycoside. What's your experience in the real world evidence about that? So, um, the, in real world, what you would need to do um, is choose your patients um, wisely. Um, in my experience, uh, I have used glycoside MR, you know, quite extensively. Uh, the only concern I would have about hypoglycemia is when I initiate insulin therapy. So you would need to have uh, to reduce or, or at least inform the patient that once, you know, you've titrated the insulin doses, uh, the combination of the two may increase their risk for, uh, for hypoglycemia. Likewise, when you add um, a GLP-1 receptor agonist, for instance, and they're already on an SU, that's a situation whereby they may also be at risk of having hypoglycemia, and therefore they need to monitor their blood glucose probably more frequently in order to avoid that. You might have to make the adjustments in their dose as well. Um, in elderly uh, patients, uh, whenever they're unwell and perhaps their um, oral intake has been reduced for whatever reason. Again, this is a time when um, the family needs to be um, informed that they would need to then monitor the uh, blood glucose levels more frequently in order to avoid um, uh, hypoglycemia. So there are really specific situations that would make you know, patients more um, at risk. But uh, by and large, that happens very, um, uh, you know, the percentage of patients that actually come in with with, with hypoglycemia on uh, glycoside MR, I would uh, say is, is really very small. Okay, so the real war evidence is low, and the general advice add on any agent always will increase the chance of uh, hypo. Right. Um, there is another question, Dr. Khadija. Uh, yeah. What about the weight gain and use in obese and renal compromised patients? Right. So for renal compromised patients, you would, um, again, need to adjust the dose. So you would need to give them a dose that is appropriate to their renal function in order to reduce the risk of hypoglycemia. Um, uh, for obese patients, um, you might want to use other agents because if, you know, um, you are trying to uh, uh, target uh, glycemia plus obesity, we have many other agents in, in the toolbox that can actually help you uh, to, um, to get to, uh, to your targets. However, um, we still have patients, yes, who are obese. They may be on metformin. They may be on the sulfonylurea. Um, and then because uh, of the obesity, you add um, a GLP-1 receptor agonist, for, uh, for instance. Um, you might still uh, want to keep the sulfonylurea on board in order to make sure that you're not compromising the glycemic um, uh, control but you're getting sort of the added advantage of um, weight reduction when you add um, something like a GLP-1 receptor agonist. Mm. There's another question, but um, you have answered it. It's, it's what do you prefer, glycoside or cetagliptine to be added next to metformin and yep. special to regards to beta cell function sparing? Right. So we've already seen that, you know, from, from this database of real world evidence that the durability and persistence is almost um, uh, similar. Um, and uh, it's been shown even in the advanced trial in, 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 in other trials uh, that have been done, you know, decades before that there is really um, no um, reduction in, 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 in the beta cell reserve. This, this concept of saying there's beta cell failure with the use of sulfonylureas is really not, it doesn't hold water um, anymore. And even if the patient has got, you know, uh, diabetes for more than 10 years, it's not that the, the sulfonylureas are not going to work um, anymore. You might have to intensify their therapy by using, you know, other agents because we know that diabetes is a multifactorial disease. Um, it's not just beta cell dysfunction that, 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 that um, is present. There's, you know, uh, uh, abnormalities in, in, in the incretin pathway. You have um, glucose, excessive glucose reabsorption, and therefore that's where the SGLT2 inhibitors um, come in. Um, and therefore you might want to um, use different agents in order to tackle the multiple 
pathophysiological defects that you know define uh, diabetes. So the old myth of SUs wearing off quickly the beta cell function is not is not accurate. Um, there's another questions. Can I give glycoside MR sixty mg twice daily? Right, so that's not what is recommended. Uh, the MR stands actually for modified uh, release. Um, and therefore, if you choose to give the 60 uh, milligram dose, it should be once a day. If you would like a higher dose, say 120 milligrams, then the patient needs to take the two tablets um, also you know, in the morning. But I don't usually recommend splitting, um, splitting the dose. Um, also for compliance issues, a patient may forget actually to, to take the dose at, um, at, uh, at the end of the day. So it's actually better if they do require a higher dose that they take it um, at the same time. But generally, Dr. Khadija, is there a significant difference in 16120 in terms of achieving the glycemic control? Um, so in some patients, it may make a difference. And we have seen that when you, you know, when you go up, you get a, a, a much um, higher reduction in their, in, in their glucose readings. Um, I usually, you know, um, start them all on the 60 and sort of um, keep them on that. But I have uh, seen in, 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 in some patients that you might actually require uh, to have a higher dose. Then again, it also depends on what their eating habits are like. Um, there's another question posted. Um, is there a specific cutoff for uh, GFR with the glycoside? Is there a specific cutoff? Now, um, if I remember what the leaflet insert says, um, in end stage renal failure, probably you might um, not want to use them because of the risk for um, hypoglycemia, obviously. Mm -hmm. But I think we can go down to, you know, I've, I've given it in patients down to EGFR of um, 30 and, um, and below. Yeah. Okay. If, if you just modify the dose and um, the patient is monitoring, um, they should be okay. Okay. So I think this was the... Ah, there is uh, one question. Time uh, duration for building up the dose. When do you escalate the dose? Yeah, so you escalate as, you know, any other agent. You want to, if you're going to start, then within six weeks, you do your hemoglobin A1C, or you can follow on with, uh, if you have the luxury of having a freestyle Libra and you're able to um, look at your time in range, you know, the patient's, you know, targets is 70% uh, of the time they're in the time in range. You might not need to escalate your therapy. Uh, but if they're not um, getting to, to that sort of target, then you might want to, to uh, increase. So uh, three months is, is um, usually the, around the time that is actually recommended for you to make a, um, a treatment change. I see. That was an interesting discussion, Dr. Khadija Hafal. And by this, we reach toward the end of the presentation. Thank you for joining us uh, tonight. Uh, so uh, just to remind the audience today uh, that this was this activity was a CME activated, um, accredited activity. Uh, today we have um, attendees above 400. Thank you for all the attendees for staying uh, till this time with us till toward the end. So and thank you for all the presenters and uh, I really enjoyed the discussion. Uh, so you'll be receiving your CME in 10 days after filling the evaluation uh, form that will be sent to your registered email. Again, just to remind for the attendees who were asking about the download of the presentation, it will be available on demand on the EDS Institute as well on the EDS Tube uh, channel. Uh, for uh, our upcoming uh, 2021 uh, webinars, uh, visit our website kindly and uh, We'll be having in 2021, the EDIC. Uh, it will be the 11th uh, Congress. It will be uh, this year virtual Congress. 
uh, kindly if you have any posters submitted to our uh, website and save the date. It's going to be on uh, uh, 4th to 6th March of 2021. Uh, thanks for our sponsors, Servir. Uh, thanks for all the attendees for taking part for the, uh, taking part and joining us in our academic activity uh, tonight. And good night, everybody.